today. Um, as you were going through your poll and, and talking about other things and previous speakers, I kept thinking, oh, I should have put that in my talk. Um, sometimes I um, introduce or have a very large introduction on the history of regeneration. I didn't put that in this talk because I wanted to tell you about some work on both the axolotl, the Mexican salamander here, and, and a freshwater worm that we study at St. Mary's. Um, I, uh, I wanted to begin my presentation with a quote from Sidney Brenner, who passed away in 2019. And the quote, and this is something that we were talking about at the very beginning, progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. And so what happens for me in science is all these new methods have come out and I'm like, aha, now I can go back and re-ask really important questions. So today's presentation is, is, is fairly basic. If you have questions, put them in the chat, sing out. Um, my goal is to tell you about axolotls and some work we've done and worms and some work we've done. But um, mostly I just want to be able to stimulate curiosity and um, and and maybe uh, plant a few seeds of of wonder. All right, so this actually, this is a headshot of a wild type axolotl. Axolotls are native to two crater lakes in Mexico, near Mexico City. They are extinct in the wild or thought to be. They're trying to do habitat restoration to create lagoons where these, where farming and the axolotls can cohabitate. They were first collected by the Spanish in 1870s and taken back to Europe and kept as um, exotic pets by the aristocracy. In, uh, in, in Mexico region, they were, they were eaten. They were eaten. Um, in the wild, they can be quite large. Uh, they keep their larval gills throughout life and never go through metamorphosis. Uh, I have slides that talk about that and I can drive metamorphosis in, a, in an axolotl by giving it a one-time injection of thyroid hormone or thyroid stimulating hormone, which is the anterior pituitary signal. Um, but pretty much they keep their larval gills throughout life. You may hear anecdotally, somebody had an axolotl that metamorphosed. Axolotls can crossbreed with white tiger salamanders. White tiger salamanders are obligate metamorphs. So if they're on the wet side of the mountain, they stay in the water. And if they're on the dry side of the mountain, they metamorphose. And so most likely if you've got a metamorphosing axolotl, it's been contaminated by white tiger salamander DNA. Um, down here, this is just a ball of California blackworms. Most people buy them for pet food. They regenerate beautifully, and I'll tell you about them. All right. So why do I, why why do I study developmental biology, and what what got me? What was my hook? My hook is is the is that I I can't help but notice patterns, and actually we all do. They catch our eye. They draw us in. They challenge us to decipher the cellular and molecular interactions to wonder what made it like that. And these are just, this is just a, an image I found on the web, but it, it, it probably speaks to many of us about the things that just capture our imagination. And so for me, even as a small child, I was drawn to this. It took sort of growing up and, and, and not doing a whole bunch of other things for me to realize that this is what I had to study. The work that I do that I'm going to tell you about today is done at St. Mary's College in Maryland. This is an old picture. This is where we are way down here. I can't tell you how many folks think we're over here, but we're not. Um, we are um, on the St. Mary's River in St. Mary's City in St. Mary's County and hence St. Mary's College. We're a public regional liberal arts honors college. And, and we've got, you know, we're, and we're co-educational. So we have, we have guys and, and girls. And what I love about it is we have more water than land. And that's what drew me um, to St. Mary's. Uh, this is just a, this is a very old picture, but this would be a typical lab group. Um, and it changes throughout the year. But in my lab, we study the California blackworm. In Massachusetts at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, I study um, Lalago Pelei, now known as Doratuthis pelei, the uh, long fin Atlantic squid. And then in my lab, I have a colony of axolotls. So we're going to talk about axolotls today, and we're going to talk about worms. These critters, these guys, they're really the, the, the most important 
um, study system I've got. Uh, basically, I help students find their lives. Uh, this lady is now a physician. This fellow runs a soccer a soccer school in Hawaii, which is not so bad. He's a physician and she's a nurse. And Kelly was just in the picture. And I don't know what happened to Kelly. She wasn't part of my lab group, but she was very nice. All right. So where does my AXO story begin? My axolotl story begins at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And it begins with meeting this fellow. David Strokum came and he gave a seminar um, for some folks. And I sat in on the seminar and he talked about these animals and he said they can regenerate their arms and their legs and their gills and their tails and their liver, but that's not a big deal. We can do that too. And I was just captivated by them. So I went and talked with him um, about the possibility of getting a master's degree in, in uh, cell and developmental biology. And he actually encouraged me to pursue a PhD um, mostly because they would pay me and I wouldn't have to pay them. And uh, he's been a lifelong friend and we're still in contact. David was the keynote speaker for the regenerative biology course that I taught at the Mount Desert Island Biological Labs um, in 2015. All right. So about the axolotl, this is a line drawing and I really like to use this drawing because it shows the beautiful gills, the large larval tail, the straight leg and the forearm that has a unique elbow bend. Axolotls have four digit hands and they have five digit feet and we can use that morphology difference to do tissue recombinations and, and follow structures. Of course, now we can actually use the green fluorescent protein axolotl. I'm just trying to shrink, oh, here we go. I'm trying to shrink down this so I can point to my slide. Um, now we have the green fluorescent protein and other transgenic animals so that we can actually follow tissues more easily. But back when I was in graduate school, we didn't have that. So again, they can regenerate all these structures, something I haven't mentioned yet. They can recover from a transected spinal cord. So you can actually make these animals quadriplegic and paraplegic and they will recover. They can actually have a portion of their forebrain removed and they'll grow that back too. And so by looking at how these organisms have such wonderful regenerative potential, we're hoping to do translational research to figure out how we might enhance healing in ourselves and for individuals who have, have traumas and surgeries and illnesses. Um, and they're fairly undergraduate proof. And so my students can work with them and they can grow well in the lab. I like to start out when I introduce limb regeneration by presenting this slide. This is not an axolotl limb. This is actually not a thalamus viridescence, the red spotted newt. This, is, um, this picture is from Principles of Regeneration by Richard P. Goss, who actually specialized in antler regeneration and, did, um, and, and was an expert in that regard. In this picture, they amputated the upper arm, so that we're going to call it the proximal arm, the upper arm of a newt, and the mid-lower arm. Okay, so there are some terms that you'll see throughout my presentation, and I'll refer to them. The humerus, the single bone in the upper arm is just like ours. We refer to that as the stylopod. The two bones, the radius and ulnar in the forearm, we refer to those as the zygopod, Z-E-U-G-O-P-O-D. And then the hand or foot we call the autopod. And that way we can compare forelimbs and hind limbs and different organisms. So here, Right through the zygopod, this animal was amputated. In the upper arm, it was amputated and allowed to go through regeneration and photographed from one to 72 days. And so what you're looking at are sequential photographs of regeneration in the red spotted newt. After amputation, a wound epithelium crawls over the surface of the stump. And that wound epithelium is really important because if you sew up the, the limb with sutures, it won't regenerate. If you take a piece of mature skin and wrap it over the end of the wound, it won't regenerate. So that wound epithelium has to talk to those stump cells and it gets them to undergo a process called de-differentiation. So they no longer look like muscle, bone, nervous tissue. They look like a more embryonic bud. We call that bud a blastema. 
and over here we call it, they've referred to bud, but you'll hear me use the word blastema. So in, these, in this series, the blastema would be this structure and it's initially not pigmented. And as development and regeneration proceeds, it starts to re-differentiate. And here you can see digit one, digit two, digit three. And here we've got all four digits. It re-differentiates in a proximal to distal pattern. And eventually all the pigment will come back and the limb will be nearly indistinguishable from a normal mature adult limb. You wouldn't know the animal had ever regenerated. What really intrigues me about this picture though, and this is, this is one of those, hmm, let's think about this. And I don't have the answer, which is exciting because that means it's still out there to, to find. If you amputate this arm or this arm, this arm, you can agree with me, has to regenerate a lot more tissue than this one. But yet they reach the same endpoint at the same time. So this blastema actually grows more quickly, elongates faster, but re-differentiates, forms the missing digits, et cetera, more quickly than this one. This one starts to re-differentiate quickly, but does it in a slower pattern. And, and we don't understand. We don't understand the timing of this. But what I'm interested in is pattern. How is this blastema different from this blastema, or are they? And, and another important concept that this picture shows and the next slide will also show is that the blastema, the amputated surface and the regenerating butter blastema that forms from it, it never makes extra stuff. It never makes more proximal limb structures normally and it never leaves anything out. So it doesn't, so if it's got to make the, the, the distal, the outer portion of the radius and ulnar before it makes the hand, it does. And so we call that property the distal rule of transformation. It can only regenerate or transform distally to its plane of amputation. And it'll do that on the limb. It'll do that if you take a blastema and you graft it into a pocket in the tail fin. It'll do that if you graft it to a different limb level. It'll, it'll only be able to regenerate the structures it normally would have. The fancy word for that is it regenerates autonomously. It regenerates true to self. So now, Bear with me, the next picture might, might, might get to a few of you, but uh, this is, it demonstrates the autonomous development. And I think it's, it's not something we do often, but this is an experiment that was done. This animal, when it was very small, was anesthetized and it was amputated at the wrist level. And it was allowed to form a blastema. And after the blastema had formed, the animal was re-anesthetized, the blastema was removed, and the eye was actually enu enucleated and the blastema was grafted right into the eye socket. In this way, there are a lot of blood vessels and nerves that feed that blastema and it regenerated only the structures that it would have had it been left in place. I want to impress on you that this is an adult animal. It was one of my breeders. It did not know it was different. It behaved perfectly normally, but this was done when the animal was quite, quite small, and this is an adult animal, and not only has the hand stayed, but it's actually grown proportionately to the animal. So this creates, again, questions about growth, questions about identity, questions about autonomous regeneration. So just keep in mind that blastemas can only regenerate structures distal to their plane of amputation. And we're gonna use that in this very next experiment. So this was the prelude to the work that I did as a PhD student, and we still haven't figured out the molecular elements behind this experiment, but we're going to. So in this experiment, this was done by a fellow named Maury Pescatelli in Dave Stokram's lab back in the 80s. And Maury wanted to be able to do an experiment where he could take a wrist blastema that can only make wrist and hand, and he wanted to graft it to a more proximal limb stump, because we already knew that when you do this, you take a, a wrist level distal blastema and graft it to a more proximal stump, you get a complete limb. But we didn't know at the time whether the limb was a transformation of the blastema and it could sort of form things backwards or if the host stump filled in the gap and underwent intercalation. 
So to do this experiment, what Maury did is he needed to be able to distinguish the tissue he grafted from the tissue from the host that he grafted it upon. And so he created what we call triploid salamanders. And now for us, we don't do very well if we have extra chromosomes in our, in our nuclei, but salamanders are not so particular. And so you can actually force an entire set of chromosomes to stay inside the newly fertilized um, axolotl egg or embryo. And so every cell of that organism is gonna have not two sets of chromosomes, but three. Now the animal becomes infertile because when it tries to make eggs or sperm, it gets very confused. So the, the eggs and sperm are infertile, but the animal can grow, develop, looks perfectly fine and regenerates. It also has every nucleus of those cells has three, three markers, what we call nucleoli. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. So Maury created these triploids. He amputated them. He took triploid blastemas from the wrist level. He grafted them onto diploid host animals and he watched regeneration. And so this is an example of that, um, the triploid host that he has, he has created. And so he's got, and actually, so this, is, this would be the graft. These pictures here are from the more proximal stru structures. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm getting this backwards. I'm, I, I was right the first time. So if you look in this circle, you see these little dots is one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three and so on and so forth. So if we go backwards, the triploid donor of the, of the wrist plastema contributed to these structures. Now he's gonna look down here and see if he's got three nucleoli. Whoops, oh, you know, I think I took that slide out. What a silly person. I was trying to, I was trying to shorten my presentation so that I wouldn't keep you up until midnight. Um, but when he looked down here, what he saw was that um, the, the cells in this region were all diploid. And so this was the first confirmation that the stump tissues intercalate the missing elements. And that wrist plastema is talking to the stump and saying, hey, I'm wrist, your upper arm, fill in the gap. I apologize for leaving that slide out. All right. About the same time, a fellow named Jim Nardi was working with Dave, and he was very interested in looking at differences along the proximal distal axis of the regenerating limb. And so Jim did a very long, laborious experiment in which he amputated axolotls at the wrist or the elbow or the upper arm, and he let them form blastemas. He also injected half of his animals, and that's what this little asterisk is all about. He injected half of his animals with radioactivity so that when he collected that blastema tissue, he would be able to visualize it later because of the radioactivity was, that was there. He let the blastemas form, he harvested them, and then he combined them in a hanging drop. So he put them in, in, in fluid, he turned the cover slip over and he stuck it with Vaseline onto a microscope slide and he cultured those cells for four days. He then went and harvested the tissue, fixed them, sectioned them and put photographic emulsion on them so that he could see where the radioactivity was. The radioactivity would, um, would expose the photographic emulsion so that he could see where radioactivity was. When he took blastemas from the wrist level, elbow, elbow level, or upper arm, upper arm level, he noticed that they just sort of pretty much fused in a straight line. And they looked at each other as if they were normal neighbors. It got more interestingly, and I'll go across this panel. This is a wrist level blastema that's not labeled. And this is an elbow level blastema from an animal that is labeled. And you can see that it's just sort of trying to engulf or come around this elbow blastema. It was even more striking when it was an unlabeled wrist blastema and an upper arm labeled blastema, and it sort of starts to engulf and come around it. This is actually only after a very few days in culture. And when he did the flip experiment of a labeled wrist blastema with an upper arm, we saw the same engulfment behavior. This suggested that the wrist blastema cells, the distal cells were more sticky to each other 
and the elbow level blastema cells were a little less and would engulf it, and the upper arm level blastema cells were even less sticky and would engulf elbow and also engulf wrist. And so if we look at this labeled elbow blastema, it's in a tight little ball and it's being engulfed by, a, um, by an upper arm blastema. So Jim, Jim was actually, the reason Jim came to do these experiments with um, Dave Stokum is because he had actually already published a paper on position-related differences in cell adhesivity and engulfment in the tobacco hornworm moth, Manduca sexta, the, um, and the pupil wing field. And my, my students work on these at St. Mary's as well. So this was what was going on when I started my graduate work in, in David's lab. Another very, very important advancement in our understanding and our ability to look at limb regeneration happened with the discovery that vitamin A, retinoic acid, proximalized regenerate pattern in amphibians. This work was done by Ni um, Iqbal Nayazi in India and later done by Maiden and Holmes and Stokum in, in Illinois, and this was in England. What Iqbal was trying to do is he was trying to apply what we call teratogens, monster makers, chemicals that would cause abnormalities to form in development and regeneration on frogs and both frog larvae and also regenerating frog larvae. So frog larvae, when they're little, they can regenerate, they can actually regenerate their, their, their hind limbs pretty well up to a certain point, but once they start to go through metamorphosis, they cannot. Um, so, so, so that's true about the about frogs. So in this panel, they all look like x-rays, but this is actually how we visualize the structures. Believe it or not, all the soft tissues are present in this limb. The limb is harvested off the animal. It's fixed. It's stained with something that recognizes cartilage. Then it's dehydrated to 100% ethanol. And then it's cleared in something called methyl salicylate, which is a fancy name for oil of wintergreen. When you brush your teeth tonight, if it tastes minty, you've probably got oil of wintergreen in there. If you um, like Canada mints or wintergreen lifesavers, you've got oil of wintergreen in there as well. But it clears the limbs so that we can actually see all the structures. So this would be the, the humerus. This is the ulna and the radius. This isn't broken. Bone is starting to form here, so it doesn't stain for cartilage. And of course, these are the wrist bones and the... Um, and the digits. If you amputate the animal at the, an animal at the wrist, you'll get a beautiful hand back. What was discovered by vitamin A treatment is if you, with increasing amounts of vitamin A from the wrist level, we can now get extra stuff. And that was huge. That was a great advancement. And it's dose dependent and it's predictable. And I actually have some vitamin A regenerating animals in my lab right now. And so if you give a little bit of vitamin A, you get a duplicated a portion of duplicated radius and ulnar, carpals and digits. If you give a bit more, you get a complete duplicated radius ulnar, carpals and digits. And here at the maximum dose, we've got a scapula from the wrist level, humerus, radius, ulnar, carpals and digits. And this is all coming from the blastema, which is really, really fantastic. So when I got to the lab, Jim Nardi had just done this work. And David said, won't this be great? You'll amputate animals, you'll treat them with vitamin A, you'll harvest their blastemas and you'll do hanging drops. And um, he wanted me to repeat the co-culture experiment, which makes perfect sense. Uh, and he fully anticipated that the vitamin A treated wrist level blastema would behave like an upper arm level blastema in, in this assay. So I went to talk to Jim. And I said, Jim, tell me about these experiments. And he said, well, many samples are, dis are discarded due to contamination and fungus. The experiments lacked a differentiated endpoint because they didn't culture for very long and they required radioactivity. And I thought, hmm. And um, you know, Dave was really keen for me to start these experiments, but as a young graduate student at the time, I was doing a lot of reading. And I came along a paper by, Sherlock and Thornton published in 67, which looked at the analysis of distal dominance in regenerating limbs. And their idea was if you took a mature hand and you grafted on top of a regenerating proximal limb 
blastema, that the mature hand would say, hey, distal is already reached, you don't have to regenerate. Well, that's not what they got at all. But their question was, can mature hands grafted near proximal blastemas inhibit regeneration? And the answer was no, the limbs regenerated anyway. But there was one line in the discussion of the paper that basically said, curiously, some grafts displace to more distal levels. That means a mature hand grafted on top of a regenerating proximal hind limb rode along all the way down to the ankle and had a foot on top of, I mean, made a hand on top of the foot or was a hand on top of the foot. So this gave me an idea. This gave me an idea. This was this, was this total um, inspiration for my thesis. So I came up with this diagram and I went to Dave to propose it. I said, how about rather than doing all the radioactivity and the co-culturing and the fungus, how about if I amputate animals at the wrist or the elbow or the upper arm, and I amputate the same animal at the mid thigh. And once they formed a blastema, I take in this example, a wrist, and I just make a little wound here and I graft it right on top. And I do similar with elbow and similar with upper arm. And my idea was that perhaps the wrist would recognize that it's wrist and ride along down to the ankle, the elbow level blastema would displace to the knee and the upper arm level blastema wouldn't displace at all. And David, and my objectives were I wanted to avoid the hanging drop culture method and fungus. I wanted to avoid using radioactivity and the need for autoradiography, which is at the time was pretty laborious. And I also wanted to enable the blastema to differentiate into a real structure so we can say, yes, I'm still, I'm still a wrist blastema, I still make a hand. And Dave said it won't work. And then he kindly gave me six months to make a go of it. And so I disappeared for six months. And um, later, uh, and later I would learn that another scientist, a very prominent limb scientist named Bruce Carlson, had tried something similar with adult animals and it hadn't worked. And Dave knew about that. So that's why Dave said it won't work. But when I talked to Bruce Carlson later, he told me he actually sewed the blastemas in place. And I think that's why it didn't work. Because if you sew something down, it's just not going to move. So let's go to, oops, let me go back. And so these are actually stained and cleared ex examples from those first experiments. And so the arrows mark where the, blast, the level of the limb where the um, blastema was grafted. So a wrist blastema was grafted here. It regenerated um, a wrist and hand. These are digit, uh, digits from the hand and it intercalated right with the ankle. An elbow level blastema grafted here displaced to the knee and made radius ulnar, carpals and digits right on top of the tibia fibula and a retinoic acid, I mean, excuse me, and an upper arm level blastema regenerated a partial humerus, radius ulnar, carpals and digits and didn't displace. We called this assay the aphenophoresis assay because blastemas displace along the proximal distal axis based on their affinity for their neighbors. I repeated all of these experiments with vitamin A treated limbs and they don't displace either. So this is a wrist level blastema. It's made of scapula, humerus, radius, ulnar, carpals and digits and did not displace. Um, Dave's, ex Dave's response after um, four and a half months of doing these experiments and I didn't tell him what was going on because I was too afraid of him. Uh, he said, it's working. And when I told him I had more of these, um, that was pretty much where my, my um, my thesis project was going. So it's with that foundation that I continue to work on axolotls at St. Mary's. Um, retinoic acid treatment treated blastemas didn't displace um, and regenerated complete limbs. Now there's a couple other experiments I just wanted to show you from that time because they illustrate how precise and beautiful this is. In this example, I have a retinoic acid treated elbow level blastema. It's made of scapula, humerus, radius, ulnar, carpals, and digits, and it didn't displace. But in one example, in one experiment, I had a retinoic acid treated wrist blastema, and it only made radius and ulnar, and it displaced to the host knee. And I thought, wait a minute, what went wrong with that? And what I want to share is that all the animals that donated four limb blastemas, so the, the wrist level blastema from the RI treated animal, that animal was also amputated at its ankle. And so I could see was the retinoic acid treatment complete? 
And did I, is it comparable to the wrist graft that I made? So the donor animal that provided the blastema was also amputated at the ankle. Examining the hind limb regenerate revealed that the retinoic acid treated blastema was only partially effective. This was a really lucky control. This is the hind limb amputated at the ankle. Again, only made tibia fibula, tarsals and digits, just like this. So vitamin A treatment truly proximalizes the pattern, but the blastema is wherever that pattern is, they can still displace. So it doesn't prevent them from displacing. So this isn't sort of stuck. All right, one last crazy experiment. We wanted to know, can retinoic acid treated host, um, can a retinoic acid treated host, so now we're going to amputate the animals at the ankle and treat them with vitamin A, and they're gonna regenerate a whole complete limb. Can a wrist blastema and untreated wrist blastema interact? And the answer is yes. So this is the host hind limb amputated at the ankle, treated with vitamin A. And now we have a complete hind limb. And this is the hand that was grafted right here and it's displaced. This is the radius ulnar of the forelimb that's displaced down to the knee. And here's an upper arm partial humerus radius ulnar carpals and digits. As far as I know, one thing we'd really like to know is what are the molecular cues that say, I'm a wrist, I'm an elbow, I'm an upper arm, and I know how to interact with my neighbors. And now we're at a place with molecular biology where we can answer that question. The reason I put Frankenstein down here is because that was my nickname in college and I can, in graduate school, and I'm sure you can appreciate why. So the preface for my PhD thesis was also borrowed from Richard P. Goss, the, the fellow who had the beautiful not of thalamus iridescence regeneration stages. And that was living things placed in embarrassing situations tend to betray their true natures. And I think that's a, a premise that I've tried to hold true to with most of my scientific experiments. If the animal can do the experiment, they're always gonna be right. So my advice to uh, young scientists is always read the old literature, let the organism do the experiment whenever possible, and trust the organism to tell you, of something, tell you something important, even if it isn't what you expect. So at St. Mary's, uh, we, we work on all these animals in my developmental biology class. We also have a, an eight credit required St. Mary's project. So this is my research lab at St. Mary's. These are some animals from my breeding colony. Um, they really, really like PVC tubes. Um, and so what I wanna tell you about is some of the experiments my students have done with me um, since being at St. Mary's. All right, so this will look familiar. You take a wrist, you graft it proximally, you get intercalary regeneration. What I didn't tell you is if you take a mature hand and you graft it, you don't get any intercalary regeneration. And that's what's happened here. This is a mature hand grafted to the stump, no intercalary regeneration. Even though I'm juxtaposing the same discontinuity of limb level, I don't get regeneration. And that's, so just, this is just looking at the other side of this animal. Well, this creates an opportunity because what we really like to know, what are we? We're a whole bunch of non-regenerating stumps. And wouldn't it be amazing in a hand crush accident, for example, if you could take the distal tip of your finger and clean it up and graft it onto the proximal stump of your finger and put some goo in there, some growth factors, some connective, some um, extracellular matrix molecules and get even just one joint back. So we went looking for clues. What would be good candidates? And so this takes me to the frog. <laughs> so, but this is, this is actually a larval frog leg. And if you amputate a larval frog leg, it regenerates pretty well. A believe it or not, a few days later, once it started to metamorphose from a teeny little tadpole into a mature frog, it cannot regenerate. In this experiment, and, and there were a lot of a number of experiments at the uh, in the early 2000s by this group Yokoyama, they actually implanted beads with a growth factor called fibroblast growth factor 10 into the the um, into the region of the limb that normally wouldn't regenerate, and they got pretty normal regeneration. So this was exciting for us. And we asked the question, can fibroblast growth factor 10 induce intercalary regeneration in axolotls? We already know that this is a no-go. What if we graft a mature hand to a proximal stump 
only in this case, we put some beads with fibroblast growth factor 10. Will we get intercalary regeneration? And I'm not gonna go into all the experiments that we've done, but um, hopefully you'll find this as exciting as I do. So we've got the beads, they're about 200 microns across, and we put them in dye, and then we soak them in growth factor. And then what we did was we implanted them at the margin between the mature tissue and the stump. And so this is my control on this side, and you can see that nothing has happened. But what was really exciting is we started to see new tissue. And I think I have a larger view of this. We started to see new tissue between the graft and the stump driving intercalary regeneration. You can actually see the beads. There's one there and there's one there. When we stain and clear those limbs, so let's look at the controls first. This is an upper arm with its beautiful four digits. This is a hind limb with its five toes. And you can see that's just to show you normal limb morphology. If I amputate this limb and I put a five digit foot on the upper arm, I get no intercalary regeneration. If I put a four digit hand on an upper thigh, I get my four digit hand and no intercalary regeneration. Well, in about 40% of the cases, if I graft this mature foot to an upper arm with FGF beads, I can actually drive a normal forelimb morphology and I get a foot at the end of a normal arm. And that foot not only is positioned properly, but it can move. So the joints are restored, the innervation is restored, the structure is restored. And so this is a four digit hand grafted onto an upper thigh. And again, we've gotten a distal femur, tibia fibula, and the hand carpals and digits. This one's not quite as pretty. This is another example of a five digit foot grafted here with FGF beads. We've got intercular regeneration. And when I went back to my student and said, hey, what's going on here? Did that animal always have a bifurcated distal tip on its finger? And, and the student went, I don't know, I never noticed. And so this is where really good notes are important. <laughs> But anyway, uh, the intercular regeneration was pretty fantastic. The problem we get, if you'll notice, this is a four-digit hand. It was grafted here. We've got normal intercular regeneration, but we formed some extra stuff out the back. And we don't know if that's because the wound didn't heal properly or, and, and it's very hard for us to determine whether or not this intercular regeneration was just snuck out underneath like my aphenophoresis assay or is actually being driven by the FGF10. These are experiments that are still ongoing in my lab. And we're also looking at the molecular markers, all the genes and proteins that are expressed during normal regeneration to try and define the exact starting point for what's important. We figure out that starting point and we can enhance healing in ourselves with it. All right. So that to, to, to transition, and it's not really a transition, it's an extension, we've started to use the green fluorescent protein axolotl in our experiments. So we don't have to worry about grafting forelimbs to hind limbs and hind limbs to forelimbs. The green fluorescent protein animal was created by injecting the gene for jellyfish uh, green fluorescent protein into early embryos that gene intercalated into the embryos and basically rode along and is now labeling them. If you shine blue light or ultraviolet light on them, um, they will glow green. So now I don't have to worry. I don't have to do what Maury Pescatelli did. I can amputate the wrist blastema from a green fluorescent protein animal and graft it onto a proximal stump. And I can see that the distal hand is largely green fluorescent protein. And I'm sure some of you are going, but wait a minute. What's all this? What's happening here? Well, this is muscle. This is skeletal muscle. And also what's here? And these are the nerves. And we're going to come back to the nerves in a minute. But the blastema was grafted here. Why are the muscle cells labeled? Well, when muscle cells form, they form tubes. So they fuse. So if one green cell here fuses with any of these cells, it's going to backload. Whoops. It's going to backload that muscle. So I think that's why this, the muscle cells that go across the joint are labeled. I'll tell you a little bit more about the nerves with another student's project. Because I, and, and you're gonna, somebody, somebody sing out and tell me what time it is because I don't have a clock. <laughs> I'm not, and I don't wanna go on too terribly long. Where are we? Oh, okay. So 
back to this. It's about 10 minutes still. 10 minutes still? Okay, great. All right, so let me go back to this. Sorry, I should have I should have put clock right here. I'm terrible about that. Um, so now these are just these are just quick spans of some of the projects my students have done. Uh, Kiana Kian Karimi um, is a physical therapist now. He actually created a lot of hybrid limbs using the green fluorescent protein animal. So in his experiments, he actually grafted the green fluorescent protein half of one limb onto a white host and let that heal in and then could amputate and he could follow what those cells gave rise to. And he, um, he was able to, to visualize and let the animal do the experiment to show that vitamin A affects the anterior cells and not the posterior cells when it proximalizes a limb. So all this structure comes from the anterior half and not the posterior half, which helped us to sort of better understand what's going on in that limb. Elaine Hernowitz, who's in a toxicology lab with rats right now, she was much more interested in nerves. So she took a green, a piece of nerve from a green fluorescent protein animal, grafted it into a white host, and then came back after it healed and amputated through that. So this is an example from her poster that she presented at the developmental biology meetings. And so here, the, the, this is part of that nerve that she grafted in. She's amputated through the cells. There are no neuronal cells in this tissue. They're only the supporting Schwann cells, the myelinating cells that help with nerve transduction. So when she did that, she basically was able to visualize how those Schwann cells proliferate and actually um, surround all the outgrowing nerves. So all this glowing stuff came from one tiny graft. And so the, the Schwann cells proliferate and myelinate all the nerves and you can visualize nerve formation in individual limbs, which is actually a pretty, is a pretty slick trick. But we also want to do an experiment. And up here, I had her coat beads with nerve growth factor. And what she found was that the Schwann cells, the supporting cells, they really like nerves, they support nerves, but they'll actually grow to nerve growth factor, but they won't grow to just the vehicle or the phosphobuffered saline. So that's another St. Mary's project. This fellow also presented at the developmental biology meetings. He was very interested in looking at whether or not skin dermis, the supporting tissue underneath your epidermis, could support muscle differentiation. And there's a very, very interesting experiment that's been done called the, um, art, the uh, artificial limb model system, the ALM. And in this experiment for the ALM, if you remove a piece of skin from the dorsal surface of a limb, it heals. If you remove a piece of skin and you denervate a nerve to that region, it will form a little bump, but then it will resorb. The kicker is if you remove a piece of skin and you denervate a nerve and you take a little piece of skin from another region of the arm and graft it in place, in some cases, you'll actually get an extra arm to grow. So Andrew repeated this experiment over and over and he took green fluorescent protein skin and dermis and grafted it here. And this is a result from his experiments. Here's that little piece of skin he grafted. And as it grew, it made an extra limb. And if we look very carefully at that extra limb, you can see it's clearly got skeletal muscle. So the answer to his question was, yes, dermal cells can form muscle in axolotls. Although my colleagues in other places think he probably just grafted a few muscle cells along, but sooner or later, we're gonna prove them wrong. But, uh, but that was from Andrew's work. Now, you mentioned jo um, uh, Johns Hopkins University and scientific illustration. So please, please share the fellow who's going to come and talk about skull, skull drawing. Um, I sent one of my students, Graham Johnson, who was more interested in lacrosse than developmental biology when he was at St. Mary's, but I sent him up to Johns Hopkins to take their scientific illustration course. He received his master's degree. He became so proficient, and this isn't a thank you note he sent me. Um, he took his Mexican axolotl with him when he graduated, and he drew these pictures as part of his master's thesis. He became the sole illustrator for, cell, um, for Tom Pollard's cell biology book. He then realized he didn't know enough cell and 
molecular biology to illustrate it. So he got a PhD at the University of Colorado, and now he has his own company and uh, is an animator and illustrator of biological molecular processes in, in, in San Francisco, which is just another interesting way our, student, our students just go on and honor us and do wonderful things. Now, I probably don't have a lot of time to talk about worms. I'm sorry, but I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to skip ahead and, and just share one little cool thing this worm can do. So it's an annelid worm, and this is the head of the beast. This is a mature worm. It's got a clear prostonium there its mouth, and you can actually count the body segments. So it's sort of student perfect because it's, it's pigmented in a beautiful way. If you amputate the worm and make a worm fragment, the dorsal blood flows posterior to anterior. So even though you only have a fragment without any head or tail, you can tell where anterior is and posterior is. What's most important is this number here, the anterior am amputation plane, regardless of where you make it, always make, makes an eight segment head. The animal grows posteriorly. California blackworms reproduce pretty much by fragmentation. There's not a lot of six going on. And so they are, an, as an important member of the benthic environment, they're important to the food web and food source of freshwater ponds and streams. So here's the head, forms a blastema, elongates and segments that eight segment head and has a pygidium or growth zone from the back. Years ago, I had a student who was interested in scanning electron microscopy. And so he did a beautiful study looking at head regeneration. And by 10 days, the animals got its beautiful head back. Posteriorly, it just keeps growing. Okay. So I had another student, Dan Backoff, who, who went on to become a physician's assistant. And I said, well, what happens when we amputate through the head? We know that anywhere along the body, it's gonna make an eight segment head. What happens if we amputate it? At, um, at three or at five or at eight segments. And what happens is if you amputate three, you get three. If you amputate five, you get five. And at 20, you get eight. So, and the tail just keeps adding. So Sarah Kramer came along and she did actually a much more precise experiment. She actually amputated through the head, two segments off a mature head, three, four, five, six, and so forth. And what she and she came up with this scheme. Basically, if it's purple, it has restored two segments and restored an eight segment head. If she amputates three, she gets three. If she amputates four, sometimes she gets four, sometimes she gets a few more. But basically, the worm regenerates precisely through the head. You amputate 10, you get eight. So if you look at what that looks like, and this will just sort of be the last little bit that I'll finish with. This is that mature head I showed you. And so if you amputate one segment, you get one segment, two, you get two, three, you get three. And, and they're, they're, you can see what's regenerated because it's pigmented. So we have um, four, you get four, five, you get five. The numbers are out of sync, I'm sorry about that. And then if you amputate 20, you get eight. And if you amputate 10, 10, you get eight, 20, you get eight, and this is the tail regenerating. So we'd like to say that it's getting a head that counts. And the tail regeneration was indistinguishable regardless of what segment. And what it, this allows us to do is it allows us to look at the effect of chemicals, possible runoff in the environment, and how they might affect this very important food item in the benthic environment. So I like to think of Lumbriculus variegatus as the canary at the water's edge. We've looked at glyphosate, we've looked at atrazine, and I have a student right now. And so I'm gonna go ahead with all of this. Oh, and they even make supernumerary heads precisely. Uh, these are my last two slides because I know I've gone long and I appreciate your patience. Um, Olivia Nasalrod, this is uh, Olivia. She's very interested in becoming a pharmacist in chemistry. So she's exploring, exploring the effects of melatonin, a very popular sleep aid on regeneration. 
and light touch, light and touch sensitivity. And she has grabbed this project and is running with it. She'll finish that up this spring. Uh, and she's really done some really marvelous work. Melatonin inhibits regeneration and causes reduction in touch and light sensitivity in the worm. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on the molecular mechanisms of that. So with all of that, I wanna thank you for your patience, listening to me rattle on about the work that we do. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from Victor Hamburger, uh, our real teacher has been and is still the embryo who is incidentally the only teacher who is always right. And, um, and I'll tease you with a few of the critters I study uh, on my summer holidays um, at the Marine Biological Laboratory. Um, I have to thank St. Mary's, the National Science Foundation, the Marine Biological Laboratory. I um, helped co-direct a program at the MBL that brought students from Hong Kong and mainland China over to do research. And I spent one of my sabbatical leaves at the Center for Regenerative Therapies in Dresden. And um, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> it's been an awful lot of fun. And with that, um, I would love to take your, your questions. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep this in, in, I guess I'll keep this in uh, show mode in case there's a question that I might need to go back and, and um, well, use. Let's, or... let's unshare real, real quick. And then okay. we can- That's perfect. Put a, a yeah, let me put a spotlight on so you. I, and should I, should I open the chat? Yeah, so- Oh, hard oh. quiz. It was a hard quiz. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I can tell you have a lot of fun in your, in your lab. I do. Right? I do. But, but, but the most important thing I do is I help my students find their lives. And yeah. um, I, for this is my 32nd year at St. Mary's. And I've, before I became Senate president a couple of years ago, I'm no longer Senate president now, which is a good thing. Um, but before I was Senate president, I was the health science advisor for a very, very long time. And uh, looking back, there are probably 500 healthcare pr practitioners in the world with my thumbprints in them. So, and then I have a tenured professor uh, at Swarthmore, one at Colby, um, one of uh, the College of Southern Maryland um, has one of my students as a professor. Um, so it's just been a lot of fun helping these students find their way. Well, we have a question um, from Charnik. We, we saw that one of your pictures had an um, axolotl with a front leg with only three toes. Do they sometimes re regrow with fewer toes? You, you're a good observer, actually. So the older animals often will regenerate not as well. Um, so, and um, they're cannibalistic. These guys are cannibalistic. So when they're little, uh, we keep them together in a pan until they really start eating each other and they can nibble at each other. And so once I see a tail that instead of going like that goes like that, um, then I start separating the animals out. But they, um, an older animal, uh, I have, I've had animals as long as 15 years in the laboratory. Um, usually my breeders cycle out somewhere around six years, but um, the older animals, if they get damaged or try to regenerate later, they'll have fewer toes. And, um, and sometimes they just don't make a complete limb. Uh, if they get a little nip, sometimes they can make extra stuff. And that's something I didn't get a chance to go over. So, so, so I'm gonna make, I'm, I'm gonna make my arm. <laughs> so if I amputate my arm, at the wrist and make a blastema. So now it's a blastema. You can see I have an anterior portion of my arm and a posterior portion of my arm. Blastema has an anterior and a posterior too. If I take this blastema and I graft it up here, it's gonna make a whole arm. And it's gonna make a hand at the end with four digits. If I take this blastema and I rotate it like this, I can actually rotate it and I can stick the posterior against the anterior and the anterior against the posterior. I hope you follow that. Well, the blastema cells don't like that either. So they do get out. And when the graft regenerates, the stump actually makes extra stuff. And so you can actually get, by rotating blastemas, 
and combining them and challenging anterior, posterior, dorsal, and ventral, you can get regenerates that have as many as, well, the, the, the biggest animal that I had with, and the oldest animal that I had with multiple supernumerary digits was Big Mama. She was this big and she had 15 digits on one hand. And, the, and she was just, she was the show and tell animal. She's the one that went to all the public schools and got, she got a lot of press, Big Mama. All right, so I'm looking. So we also have, yeah, and, and we have, somebody said that this has been an absolutely fascinating presentation. And I agree because it's, um, it's, it's been a little bit, it, we, it's, it's wonderful to see science and how the, the questions are asked and the, the process involved. And it's also interesting to see that your students take this, this knowledge and this process and go on to completely other different things, which I think is really cool as well. And Rebecca asks about um, the, where a hand was regenerated on the hind leg, was it still functional? Okay, so this is a good question. So if I graft, if I graft a blastema to what I call a neutral territory, it's just going to form that structure and it's not going to do anything. If I graft the, if I graft a blastema flush onto a stump, it will intercalate and it'll be functional and it'll move just like a foot if I graft it on the leg or a hand if I graft it on the arm. In a few cases with the aphenophoresis assay, so a wrist blastema grafted onto the mid thigh and it displaces out, as it's riding along, it's innervated. And so when the foot goes, the hand goes. In a few cases with, if it's an upper arm level blastema, even then in a few cases, the nerves that feed the leg feed the arm. And so the feet go and the hand goes. So it's, it's, it's interesting. So, but, but the nerves, the nerves can, can innervate, hind limb nerves can innervate a forelimb structure to, to, to extend and, and flex. So, okay. We got our, okay, hey. So for the axolotl where a hand was regenerated in the hind limb, was it, okay, was it still functional? The answer is yes. Uh, we got our axolotl as a baby and he only has three toes on the front leg. It is also smaller than the, how long ago did you get it? It could just not have completed growing. Um, how, how long ago have you had this axolotl? It may just need to grow. And what are you, what are you feeding it? What are you feeding it? And, and uh, my guess is it'll catch up. It'll catch up. There were these really strange experiments done by a fellow named Charlemagne back in the 70s. And he was looking at size regulation and he did em embryo graphs between large salamanders and small salamanders. And so he put like small salamander headed half embryos on top of large salamander body embryos. And he got really dinky little heads on big salamanders. So the size is, is genetic, but for your axolotl, it should grow. You've had it for two years. Hmm. It, so, so, so email me, email me uh, at the college, kcrawford at smcm.edu. Um, questions I would ask is how do you keep it? What's the water? What are you feeding it? Um, because it really should grow. It really should grow unless it's, unless it's something weird with the nerve innervation, but it really should grow and be, be comparable. It really, so. And, 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 and tell me how, take a picture of it, send me an email. I, I'm happy to be your AXO expert. Cause, cause oh, I, that would be great. Well, that and actually something I didn't say is every spring, um, we don't, I don't adopt out the transgenics because they're transgenics, but every spring when we're, we're done with our experiments, um, we uh, adopt out uh, white and wild type axolotls. So the first time I did this, I adopted out 165 axolotls. And the next year we only adopted out maybe 80 and I was disappointed. And then until one of my students very wisely said, but Dr. Crawford, everybody's got them. And so there are a lot of teachers and a lot of folks in the community that have axolotls from here all the way. We've, I've got an axolotl in Chicago. So, so well, we might have to, we have a very active herpetology club and uh, uh, they're very into husbandry. Um, so come visit in April, we'll have animals. 
you might have to come down and, and to your, do a, a tour to your lab and maybe uh, at, when you're adopting them out. Absolutely. And I can send you a care sheet. I'll send you an email uh, by email. I'll send you a care sheet that I give out as sort of a general information if you're thinking about getting an axolotl thing. And Tom asked, does the quality of the regeneration depend on the type of amputation? A traumatic ragged cut opposed to a scalpel cut? It doesn't seem to. Um, it doesn't seem to, although, all right, so when you think about the limb, the limb has a field. And if you cut deep into the, the pelvic or the shoulder girdle, you can get an abnormally formed limb or no limb regenerating. Um, when we amputate the animal, the soft tissues pull back, especially if it's in, in the middle or the middle upper arm, the soft tissues will pull back. We usually trim the bone so it's flush, so that it's an easier wound epithelium um, formation. However, if you don't, it'll grow over it anyway. So it shouldn't really matter. Um, and if you, if you, oh, my students, oh my goodness. So if this is a blastema and they're supposed to cut here, sometimes they cut like that. I mean, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard to do these surgeries, um, but all the students in my, my developmental biology class, they get practical experience with microscopes, with grafting, with manipulation. Um, we look at planaria and hydra and California blackworms and sponge cell reaggregation and sea urchin fertilization and embryogenesis and dictyocelium slime mold slug regeneration, uh, aggregation, um, chick embryogenesis, xenophis embryogenesis, axolotl embryogenesis, um, and squid, and squid. So we do, we do a lot of, they get a lot of experience and they, they turn into really good um, scientists with it. The okay. rich acid, the speed of regeneration depends on the age. Yes, big animals regenerate. It, what's really funny, Big animals, they regenerate very slow. And they actually, I mean, if, you're, if your pet animal is big, the limb is gonna be really tiny when it first regenerates. It's almost as though it can't make a big blastema, it makes a small blastema. It regenerates the limb and differentiates and then it grows. And so that's probably what's happening with the animal that's two years old, but I'd like to know how old it is, where do you feed it, this kind of thing. And so yes, um, this, a small animal this big, will replace its limb, will re replace its limb in two weeks. The animals that are more hmm, five centimeters long that we're working with, uh, that my students tend to work with, four to six weeks. And they've got a normal morphology back that will then you know, grow and large and be with the animal. All of my breeders have regenerated. I have one of my favorite breeders is a, a fellow named um, Blackfoot. When he was little, he received a black, um, foot blastema on his proximal white leucistic limb, and he's got this beautiful black foot at the end. So we call him Blackfoot. And I guess that kind of plays into the frog situation when they were the smaller uh, baby frogs versus when they get to be um, adults. Is that, does that, does that right. follow so, along or is it completely different? Well, it, it's a little different. All right. And, and actually, People have um, used my, my uh, metamorphosis. Um, you can stimulate an axolotl to metamorpho to go through metamorphosis. And actually, a wild type axolotl looks very much like a tiger salamander, black with yellow spots. It's it's striking. And there was a paper I published in '98 with a student from St. Mary's where we did all of that work. Um, the the Xenopus. So Xenopus are these African clawed frogs anyway, they're kind of different uh, clawed. And um, Xenopus larvae, when they are stage 52, which is like 52 days after fertilization, if you amputate their hind limb, they'll regenerate it. Four days later, four days later, they haven't metamorphosed, but they're in the process of kicking that in. You amputate that hind leg and you get nothing. Now, the Xenopus adult frog, if you amputate its forelimb, it looks like it's trying to regenerate, but it makes a spike. So do we call that regeneration? It's a spike. And, um, and so what folks are trying to do, and 
And we can actually regenerate this much of our finger. You probably knew that. But as long as a portion of the nail bed is there and you don't sew it up, if you sew it up, game over. But in the literature, especially children up through young adults, if you let the wound epidermis crawl over the surface, it'll, cells will de-differentiate and you'll get a pretty normal fingertip back. And it's rare that I talk to 150 people, 300 people, and somebody doesn't have some uncle that cut off his finger in a woodworking accident and grew the tip back pretty well. Once you get past this joint though, you get past this joint, um, we can't regenerate. And a newborn mouse pup can regenerate this, but once you're into this, they can't. So a lot of folks are working on trying to drive mice to be in the laboratory to regenerate through this joint. I actually think the FGFB graphs that I've been doing are gonna get us there faster. We're gonna figure out the right glue, matrix, goo, seeded with the right growth factor signals that allow for joints to form. And that's, I mean, that's the ideal is to get a joint back and ideally be able to enhance joint healing because what happens to us, that's, you know, artificial knees, artificial hips, artificial shoulders, artificial elbows, they're all great, but wouldn't it be super if we could just sort of figure out the right, figure out the right magic mix? You may have heard of this um, platelet concentrated injections they're doing into joints that seem to help heal or support joint health. Um, that's sort of a, a baby step towards what I'm envisioning we might do someday. But I, I don't have the facilities at St. Mary's to do all of that work, but um, I can sure seed the ideas and send my students off to do stuff. Well, that's, and that's kind of the final question is, is based on uh, being on the front lines of, of this kind of research, what, are, what is the most exciting thing that you, you, can, you, you see uh, or on the horizon based on this? All right. So... I don't envision us. That's a good, it's a great question. These are all great questions. Um, and um, I should say that, I should say that more. I don't envision we're going to be growing arms and legs back. I do envision probably the holy grail. The holy grail is going to be this spinal cord healing, regrowth question. Now, what happens with axolotls? And, and folks have looked at this pretty well, the cells that are in what we call the central canal, that cerebral spinal fluid goes down, it's a really small little hole. Those cells called ependymal cells proliferate and basically glue the ends of the spinal cord that's cut in the axolotl back together and create a matrix that allows the nerves to grow through. We have, population of cells in our nervous tissue, spinal cord, brain, called astrocytes. They look like stars. And those astrocytes do a whole bunch of stuff. They feed neurons, they regulate growth factors, they create the blood-brain barrier. They have little perivascular feet that create the blood-brain barrier. They also scar. So when, when, when you watch football and there's an injury on the field and they rush the guy off and they're worried about the spinal cord, the first thing they do is they chill him down. They get him cold. They wanna reduce the inflammation and they wanna quiet down those astrocytes because if they quiet down the astrocytes, normal healing can better happen. Now with a transection for us, there's, that's another whole, that's another whole problem. But what I, I would say is in, not, in my not in my generation, maybe not my children's generation, maybe for them, but somewhere in there, we're going to figure out how to quiet the wound site of a spinal cord injury to facilitate and allow for healing, especially for younger people, you know, 20s, young adults, children, and the like. And I think that's the holy grail. The holy grail is going to be restoring nerve function after transection and major injury. Uh, because we're really good at, at injuring our spinal cords. 
and 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 everything everything that controls your arms is right here so i always tell my students cherish your connective tissues treasure your bones guard your neck guard your neck because it's this is this is this is the important stuff and um and life is life is long and you want to live it well you know and prosper so so I, I, that's what that's what my hope is is that we're going to with all this molecular biology single cell sort you know single cell gene analysis we're going to start to really be able to use molecular tweezers to fig figure out what's the hierarchy of who's talking to who and how can we reawaken that in the right way to allow for better healing and recovery and regeneration in ourselves. Well, and, on that note, thank you. Oh, thank you. No, I was just going to say, if you have questions, don't hesitate to email me. I'll do my best yeah, to yeah. get things That's back. That's wonderful. I'm glad that we are connected. And thank you, um, not only for this presentation, but for um, adding the the steps towards that, um, that, that holy grail that we hope to get to at some point. So um, thank you for your contributions and your students' contributions uh, to that effort. And um, we'll be in touch about coming down and visiting you down yes. at the beautiful St. Mary's uh, uh, at college down there. And there's, there's more to Southern Maryland than just fossils, folks. So oh, and I love the fossils too, though. I got boxes of them. I mean, I can't, I've yeah. got a rib, I got a whale rib this big. And and when I teach anatomy, I bring it into class and I ask the students, which side of the whale did this come from? And they're like, I don't know. I said, you can figure it out. Oh, that's a good homework for us all. Now we're going to go back and look at all of our, our whale vertebrae at, at home and at the museum. Um, Everyone, thanks for coming. Remember Thank next you. week, next week we're gonna learn about the human women computers and how you can get involved in transcribing their notebooks. Um, I hope that I'll see y'all back here again. And in the meantime, stay well, stay curious, and stay outside. Get outside and, 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 and find something new. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you again, Dr. Crawford. Oh, my pleasure. It's been a joy. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.